So, guys, it's been over five years since Offworld Industries released Squad into early access. And in that time, it's led to the resurgence of the project reality style tactical shooter genre. More people are playing these games now than probably ever before, and that's allowed for quite a few new franchises to pop up and carve out a niche for themselves. Most importantly, Offworld have actually started supporting the development of a number of squad-style spin-off games that throw that formula into different themes. And, well, just this week, we got the latest instalment in the Offworld collection, Beyond the Wire, taking us back to World War I. The question is, though, is it just a spin-off or is it something more? Well, guys, this is Billy 8 World again, and let's find out. All right, guys, how you going? Welcome to the video. And like I said, today we're taking a look at Beyond the Wire, which just launched into early access yesterday. And like I said, really at its core, this is pretty much a squad spin-off game published by Offworld, but developed by a new studio called Redstone Interactive. And when I say spin-off, I mean, well, it kind of feels more like a mod than a standalone game, which honestly isn't a bad thing. I mean, a lot of games start out this way. But at the end of the day, that's probably the most important thing you'll want to know before you buy this game. If you're familiar with Squad or even Postscriptum, well, you should feel right at home with Beyond the Wire. Now, if you're new to off-world games, though, well, the main thing you'll probably want to know is that they're all pretty much loosely based on a style of gameplay that was made popular by the legendary mod for Battlefield 2, Project Reality. In a nutshell, they're all large-scale style tactical shooters that put the focus less on the shooting and more on things like teamwork and communication. They all put a major focus on squad level tactics with class systems designed to support each other and to discourage lone wolfing. And not just that, but the core mechanics are way more intense than your average FPS game as well. There's almost no HUD and things like recoil, suppression and damage are all turned up to 11. Now, with that being said, the big difference is, like I said, Beyond the Wire is set in World War One, And I've got to say, thankfully, the devs have done a great job at trying to stay historically authentic in this game, whereas in most other World War One games, they can be pretty loose. Obviously, the other two World War One games that spring to mind are Verdun, which was pretty hardcore but stopped short of being fully authentic, and, of course, Battlefield One, which basically didn't feel like a World War One game at all. Whereas I think Beyond the Wire really does try and capture not only the look of World War I, but also the authentic flow of the combat. And that's something that we really haven't seen too often before. So what do I mean by that? Well, firstly, when you think of World War I, you probably think of something like fairly linear trench warfare across a destroyed wasteland of mud and shell holes. You probably think of mass wave attacks and brutal hand-to-hand -hand fighting in the trenches. And in a nutshell, that's pretty much the experience that the devs are going for in Beyond the Wire. The big change that it makes from Squad, though, is that the maps are much smaller and skinnier, and the game modes are focused on sector rows enforced by a very strict out-of-bounds mechanic. And not just that, but the devs have also sped up respawn time and added the ability for players to spawn on squad leaders. And that combined with the smaller maps leads to players concentrating head-to-head -head along a front line, just like you would have seen in the actual war. Now, obviously what that means is that the pacing of Beyond the Wire is much faster than Squad. And you'd think that it also mean your expected lifespan should be a lot shorter as well, right? And well, yes, that's kind of true, but I also think the devs realized that if they wanted mass attacks to work across No Man's Land in a game that has a hardcore damage model, well, they were also gonna have to figure out how to keep the players alive for more than two seconds. So how do they actually achieve that? Well, you've got to remember that the standard small arms of the First World War were actually bolt-action rifles, and, well, they fire really slowly. 
And so not only are the players firing less bullets to begin with, what the devs have also done is seem to have intentionally increased the strength of mechanics like weapon sway, meaning it's actually really quite hard to land accurate hits at longer ranges. Now, bearing that in mind, there's probably a good chance if you get into this game, you're probably going to be super frustrated by that. But pretty soon what you'll realize is that the reason the devs have designed the game this way is because they want players to rely less on ranged weapons and to get into melee combat. And once you figure out that it's just as hard for the enemies to hit you as it is for you to hit them, well, that's when the game gets a lot more fun. You'll start to play more aggressively, and not just that, but you'll get this adrenaline rush every time you miss a shot and you have to make the choice of whether or not you want to wait for your gun to reload or just charge in with your bayonet. Now, bearing that in mind, I'm probably guessing at this point in the video, you're either thinking that sounds totally like my kind of game or nah, I think I'm going to pass because look, obviously that kind of game design does make it pretty niche, which is why I think a lot of World War One games stop short of trying to be actually authentic. But like I said, I think Beyond the Wire does manage to pull it off. But the price of that authenticity is that it doesn't feel like most other FPS games or maybe no other FPS games at all, including Squad, which means that it's not going to be able to build its player base from just about any other game. Like I said, even World War One games like Battlefield 1 are a world away from this one. And look, we'll get into what I think is going to happen with the community in just a bit. But another thing that isn't really going to help it build a player base is that this isn't the full release yet. This is just the early access launch, which means that it doesn't have a full set of content. For example, it's only got three maps, three factions, a limited set of weapons, and as far as I can tell, no logistic system. There also isn't any vehicles in the game yet, and like I said, there's a ton of assets that seem to be placeholders from Squad, which you can tell that were probably just left in to get the game out on time. And not just that, but there's quite a few early bugs that are popping up as well. So you can understand why at this stage, a lot of people are actually wondering, is it actually even worth it yet? Now, obviously, we can't see into the future, but I think if you look back at the development of Squad and also Postscriptum, we could probably make a pretty good prediction of where Beyond the Wire will be in a few months and maybe even a few years. And, well, Squad is the obvious one to look at first, as it's just released into version 1 with 20 maps, 7 playable factions, as well as tanks, helicopters, and a ton of wheeled vehicles as well. The problem is though, it took five years to get there. And you've got to remember that unlike Beyond the Wire, it's not only published by Offworlds, but it's actually developed by Offworld as well. And so I'm not saying Beyond the Wire is gonna get thrown under the bus, but it's also obviously not the flagship game like Squad is. And so I think it's probably optimistic to think it's gonna grow anywhere near as fast. Now, obviously, I could be completely wrong, but when you take a look at, for example, Postscriptum, which is also developed by another studio called Periscope Games, you can see what I mean. It's definitely still growing slowly two years on, but if that game has one weakness, it's that it took over a year to get its first really substantial content updates. During that time, it was barely playable outside of Europe and North America. And look, in fairness, it seems like the devs are getting their act together and getting content out on a more regular basis now, but it's still a fairly slow process. And while I don't want to be a doomsayer, but I think you can probably expect the same to happen with Beyond the Wire. After this initial launch period, my guess is it's going to drop off pretty quickly and it might be a few months or even a year until it begins to pick up again. Now, with that being said, though, the good news is that the one thing you can rely on with off-world games is that eventually they're going to be good, even if it does take a few years. And not just that, but they generally also stick to their fundamental design concepts, unlike a lot of other games these days, which bend in the wind when the community complains about one thing or another on Reddit. So if I had to say whether or not Beyond the Wire is worth the launch price of 50 Aussie dollars, well, I'd say it really depends on how long you plan on sticking around. If you're just here to play this game casually, well, maybe it's not worth buying right now, maybe in a few months, but if you are a diehard tactical shooter fan and you're looking to stick around 
for the long term, well, of course, then it's totally going to be worth it. At the end of the day, though, if you're someone who's completely new to these types of games, though, well, there's a few things that you probably should bear in mind before you pick this one up. Firstly, it's not going to look, feel, or sound as polished as a AAA game like Battlefield 1. And secondly, you absolutely will get frustrated trying to just figure out how to survive. But with that being said, if you do like a challenge and you are willing to put in the hours to get good, just like Squad or Postscriptum, you'll actually probably get more hours out of this one than you would out of a AAA game. For example, you can bet that in a few months, there's going to be players in this game that'll have multiple thousands of hours logged. And for 50 bucks, well, by any stretch of the imagination, that's a pretty solid investment. But anyway, guys, that just about wraps up this quick review. So as always, if you like what you see, please remember to like, comment, and subscribe. And of course, just remember that I can't possibly cover every single detail of this game in one video. So if you think I've missed something, please put it down below in the comments so that everyone else can see before they make up their mind to buy this game. As always, though, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, and please feel free to check out the links in the description if you want to see any more of these videos. And also, don't forget you can find my Twitter and Discord links down there as well if you want to keep in touch. And as always, until next time, see you later, and have a good one.